right, well, I'll, I'll take it easy as we begin, as people trickle in. I know there's a few more signed up to come this evening. Um, so I'm Melissa Cortez. I'm a, a junior faculty here in the, at the university in the uh, neurology department. I'm a member of the general neurology division and um, a sort of special invited member for the headache division as well, um, largely because of uh, my research and my clinical practice that overlap um, uh, specifically related to post-traumatic headache, which is what I'd like to talk with you about today. Um, is the mic working okay? Uh, so I'll begin with uh, defining post-traumatic headache and some other key terms around uh, the topic and the discussion uh, that we'll uh, uh, go through this evening. And I'll uh, spend the most time on some management pearls that I've discovered uh, in, in my own practice and uh, maybe some sort of twists on uh, what uh, is traditional practice. And then we'll spend a little bit of time really emphasizing the role of prevention uh, as a type of headache that's potentially preventable. Post-traumatic headache is unique in that manner. Um, and there are a few ways in which I'll highlight opportunities there. And then I'll uh, share with you a little bit about research happening here at the university and um, how it relates to uh, migraine headache and the other research that you may have heard about if you were here last week uh, with Dr. Brennan. So in trying to understand post-traumatic headache is, is, is not unlike trying to understand migraine. And I borrowed this little uh, snippet of a slide from my mentor, uh, Dr. Brennan, who spoke last week or two weeks ago uh, about the biology, neurobiology of migraine. Uh, using it to extend from migraine to post-traumatic headache. And with the uh, analogy that having post-traumatic headache is like having your volume knob or your amplifier turned up too high. Um, everything in the environment is more um, irritating at lower levels. Um, you're hypersensitized. And we call that, um, or we can think of that as a disorder of gain or volume control. Um, and that is, uh, it reaches a number of things, not just sensory, um, sensory including light and smells and uh, sounds, uh, movement in the environment, but also something we call homeostasis or the autonomic uh, nervous system function, which is a special arm of our nervous system that controls how we uh, accommodate the environment with our nervous system, how we um, account for standing up with our blood pressure and heart rate, how we adapt to a hot room or a cold room. Um, our autonomic nervous system also controls our gut and our bladder and all our heart rate and our blood pressure, all these automatic functions. And these are disrupted uh, in headache disorders as part of the headache attack and even uh, likely between headaches. And affect or emotional components um, play a role in, in the experience of headache. And as we'll describe here in a few minutes, um, maybe particularly in post-traumatic headache. So what exactly is post-traumatic headache? Well, it is the most common symptom that is experienced after any type of head injury or, or head trauma. And uh, in the acute days uh, in the following the injury, this can be one of the number one symptoms that leads to uh, uh, part of the diagnosis of a concussion, um, can occur with more um, severe traumatic brain injuries uh, beyond that which would be described or defined as a concussion, which is, uh, un falls under the category of mild traumatic brain injury. More severe injuries can also uh, cause acute headache, and whiplash injuries are among a few. This can linger for beyond a, a week up to several weeks um, and um, can be one of the leading symptoms of something called post-concussive syndrome. Uh, this syndrome is also accompanied by, in addition to headache, chronic nausea, chronic light sensitivity, chronic dizziness, imbalance, impaired reactivity time, um, difficulty uh, dealing with uh, active environments, difficulty sleeping, changes in mood. And in a, in a few, uh, this can persist beyond weeks into months. And uh, we define this as chronic post-traumatic he headache once it's been present for beyond three months in an individual. But this can extend far beyond six months to a, over a year in some. 
How common this is is difficult to count. It depends on how you define post-traumatic headache, how far after an injury you make that diagnosis, how far after the injury you ask if somebody has developed new headaches or worsening of pre-existing pre headaches. But we do know that uh, almost two million head injuries show up in the ER or the hospital each year. And we know that many more than that um, don't come to the hospital, probably don't even go to the primary care doctor. And many people can describe a history of having had what they think retrospectively was a concussion, but they didn't go see a doctor for it because they waited a few days and, and they felt mostly better. So being able to count how many people this affects is actually quite difficult. So I wanted to share with you um, just a few um, videos from the CDC. There's a program uh, that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, has launched called the Heads Up Program, and that's where I've borrowed these videos for this evening. So here's just a brief definition of concussion. Let's see if we can get it to go. can't get it off the pointer. Aha, I knew this was a chance of happening. Just a moment, let me pu pull it up the old-fashioned way. So there's a resource center that the CDC has um, designed for educational purposes, and again, that's where I've borrowed these videos, um, trying to educate more broadly about concussions. Those are concussions we didn't go to our doctor about, um, and why they might be important. And volume. Die. Caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or by a hit to the body that causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement can literally cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, stretching and damaging the brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. What you might not know is that these chemical changes make the brain more sensitive to any increased stress or injury until it fully recovers. So that last part um, is important, and we'll talk about that a little bit with prevention. So just as difficult as it is to define how many people get post-traumatic headache, it's also um, different, difficult to know um, exactly how many people who are injured will go on to develop. What is the risk? Um, and there's two separate, those are two se epidemiologically separate numbers to try to figure out. Because of these, this difficulty and def definitions that I mentioned a moment ago, we have very wide ranges of, of, of estimates. But we think at least if you cut this in half, half of people um, will have some form of post-traumatic headache, whether it's exacerbation of headache that, pre that was pre-existing before they had their energy injury, or if it's a new onset headache following their injury. And the important thing about post-traumatic headache compared to what we call primary headaches, primary headaches being migraine headache as a, the most common example um, that occur sort of independent of some kind of trigger, post-traumatic headaches occur um, secondary to a trigger. Um, these uh, come with more disability. They, m people who experience chronic post-traumatic headache are more likely to be disabled, more likely not to be able to function in their prior work activities at one year. The interesting thing about post-traumatic headache is more likely to occur after a mild head injury, and I define concussion as a mild head injury. Moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries, or TBI, is, is commonly abbreviated, are actually less commonly, though still associated with post-traumatic headache. It's the mild injuries um, that are uh, the most, the biggest culprit. 
And this is on the rise uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one being improved um, protective gear for our military personnel has allowed them to survive um, more uh, varieties of blasts. Um, they survive with a concussion and they go on to, to experience long-term uh, consequences of that concussion. Uh, we originally thought about post-traumatic headaches uh, in terms of their cause in a rudimentary fashion. We thought, well, surely it must be direct damage to bone or blood vessels or, or muscles that lead to the headache itself. And um, for a long time, early research tried to define an imaging measure of this to be able to, to see the damage that is occurring and leading to these headaches. And um, really, in a majority of mild head injuries, imaging is entirely normal. What we know more now, and we're currently working on uh, in the research realm, is looking into what we call a functional problem, where there's not something that you can see that's damaged, but it's something about how the way the structure and the circuit work together, the neurologic circuits and the inflammatory circuits and the pain circuits, and how they're communicating, lead to this headache. In an acute setting, uh, right after the injury, this is likely related to activating substances of, some, of a series of chemicals that come together to be what we call neurogenic inflammation. This is an inflammatory cascade that looks like other injuries that, can, that is the sort of early phase. And in those whose headache resolves, their headache often resolves on the same time course as this infl inflammation uh, resolving. But in those whose headaches persist beyond the acute phase into weeks and months, um, there are um, changes that happen in pain receptors and how they're reacting to, to re usual pain signals. And there's dysfunction in pain inhibition pathways, pathways that usually um, allow us to adapt and decrease our pain, painful responses to environmental stimuli that occur. And these are complex pathways that share um, nerves that run through the spine, thalamus, and cortex, uh, different regions ranging from our spinal cord up into our, the middles of our brains and the outsides of our brains. So what, what does it sound, feel like to have a concussion? And I wanted to share with you um, this. Let's see if this will work. Uh, because of the overlapping symptoms with concussion and persistent post-traumatic headache. OK. Let me just pop out and find this gentleman on the website. We've got to learn to see all of the symptoms, especially when it comes to something as serious as head trauma, to get them off the field with much greater frequency. There are so many kids running around the field, the only person watching an individual kid is their parents. And they might see that they fall out and hit their head and get up really slow or, or fall again. Uh, and they might realize that they need to get that kid off the field. Because we don't have the same advantages in youth sports that the pros do or even the colleges have on field uh, physicians or on field athletic trainers, uh, then we don't have those trained individuals looking for this injury. And so we've got to find different methods then to go about identifying that. They get a hit to the head, they always need to be checked by a healthcare physician or whatever because they, they have the right tools and they can take the right testing to make sure and understand if it's really a concussion and if it's just like, you know, some bad hit or anything like that. And so parents need to, you know, pay attention to what their children are doing and what they're at risk for. They always say, when in doubt, set them out. And that's for coaches, but it goes for parents too. So most people, as this highlights, are, are healthy individuals before getting a post-traumatic headache. Um, these type of headache can uh, be worse and more disabling in older individuals at the time of their injury, in women, and in those who have a history of anxiety or depression uh, before the onset of the injury. They're also at higher risk if they have had a prior head and headache disorder, say pre-existing migraine. And um, interestingly, also at higher risk if there's a family history of headache disorder, such as migraine. 
In contrast to migraine, post-traumatic headache really does affect men about as equally as women. And part of this is because of the incidence of those who are exposed to head injuries um, increasing. Um, though we know that being uh, female uh, increases the risk of severity and susceptibility, the actual numbers are more equal in this type of headache disorder. And part of that is because young males are the highest risk group to get head head injuries um, that ultimately result in persistent headaches. Currently, um, or at least in sort of a semi-recent review of causes, the most common cause of post-traumatic headache was motor vehicle accidents, uh, followed by falls, um, just incidental falls. And this even goes uh, for uh, military groups. Uh, not all are blast-related injuries. Um, these are very common uh, t uh, types of injuries. Uh, assaults and sports injuries representing uh, the uh, fewer number. Though it's recognized in uh, the last decade that sports injuries are um, likely very underreported and that this number is probably underestimating uh, its contribution uh, to post-traumatic headache. So why do we care so much about the concussion component of this and why am I spending time? This young lady uh, will share a little bit about its importance. It was January 10, 2005. I was 17 years old and my high school basketball team was playing a varsity game and it was around the second quarter and I was going up for a rebound and as I came down, um, the back of my head collided with the top of another girl's head. The next day, after the day I got hit, I went to school and I was really sick. I knew I had a concussion because I suffered through a concussion my seventh grade year. I had all the symptoms, dizzy, nauseous. Um, I couldn't focus in school. I continued to play a second game after that and I passed out after the second game in the locker room. Basically, I was bedridden in my house for about six months straight. I slept on the couch because of the light. We had to put dark sheets over the windows. Um, my mom and my sister had to help me walk around. Um, I lost my balance. I couldn't really get that back for quite a while. I didn't know it could get this bad. All athletes have a strong will and since we're young we know that we have to suck it up. Suck things up whether you know you sprain your ankle or you hurt your finger. You just go in the game and you shake it off and you don't complain, you don't cry. But this is a brain and head we're talking about and you can't suck it up. So unfortunately, instead of missing a game, I missed the season, I missed sports for the rest of my life, and I missed out on a great life that I could have had. Athletes need to know, if you think you have a concussion, don't hide it, report it. It's better to miss one game than the entire season. You can find information on concussions at www.cdc.gov slash concussion and youth sports. So there's this, I think, increasingly now recognized underreporting of, of concussion to, to medical providers. And it creates a delay in our ability uh, to, to, to treat appropriately. Um, so what are the, the steps towards that? So one is trying to identify what type of headache um, the post-traumatic headache is, is, is taking, what type of form it's taking. Um, depending on uh, the population you look at, uh, these can range widely in terms of distribution. Um, but it's split approximately half between tension type headache and migraine type headache. Um, and identifying which of those types of headache help guide the, the treatment pathway um, towards um, the therapies that might be valuable of first, for first try. There are many, um, or up to 15%, that can be nonspecific, mixed, or even variant types, and those can be even more difficult to um, initially um, identify um, if without a specialty provider. Uh, 
And importantly, uh, post-traumatic headache symptoms are often accompanied by persistent changes in mood, um, irritability, changes in sleep, um, uh, persistent difficulties with balance and chronic dizziness, uh, prohibiting uh, exercise uh, or normal work-related activities. And these are symptoms that are also important to identify as part of the uh, symptom set and target with treatments. To date, uh, there are no specific pharmacological treatments um, or large-scale clinical trials. Uh, and there have been small retrospective analysis and some small treatment um, studies um, that have been conducted. One that I highlight here is one that looked back at uh, almost 150 post-traumatic headaches and looked at what medications were being used to treat those headaches. And a, a vast majority were over-the-counter Tylenol and uh, NSAIDs or ibuprofen uh, leave. Um, but only a quarter of those individuals were reporting efficacy or, or relief from those over-the-counter agents. And a, ver a vast minority had been tried on headache-specific or migraine-specific medicines in this review. Though um, more recent reviews and um, uh, it's recognized that it is, there is a need to try migraine-specific medications, and up to 70% uh, may respond during an acute headache attack to uh, migraine-specific triptans, uh, that family of medicines that help during the attack of a migraine headache. And in those groups, um, this initial retrospective analysis, those were used very rarely. And part of this has been because it's not been clear um, historically whether these are, should be treated like migraine, even though they may uh, manifest like migraine. Um, or again, there's been a long delay in getting to, to a provider that's aware of uh, migraine-specific medicines. And many other um, pain, traditional pain agents have been tried, or over-the-counter agents have been tried before getting to, to trying a triptan. Importantly, when these headaches have become chronic, um, again, treatment will overlap with uh, migraine and chronic headache treatment, um, trying to align with the type of headache that is, that is being experienced. And uh, I highlight here four um, common prophylactic agents that are used for migraine. And the one with the best efficacy, at least in uh, one retrospective trial, um, was topiramate. But these others have been commonly used, amitriptyline commonly used, due to its assistance uh, with um, sleep. Um, these are all medicines that are FDA approved for migraine, but again, not specifically indicated for post-traumatic headache, as there are none uh, currently approved. I, I listed these three injection type um, agents and, and the top I've listed uh, botulinum toxin uh, currently available um, in a number of forms. Botox uh, is exa an example uh, that is used and approved for chronic migraine. And there I think is promising evidence that this could be helpful in post-traumatic headache as well. In addition to depending on the distribution of the pain, certain types of trigger points and nerve blocks. And I think because of how refractory these headaches can, ha, can be, um, because of, the again, the delay to getting to treatments, these are really um, uh, promising things to, to go to proactively and early in, in treatment of post-traumatic headache. I highlight here um, two uh, uh, fairly recently FDA-approved uh, non-invasive devices, again, approved for migraine headache with some promising early studies in post-traumatic headache. The first here, um, pictured by uh, this young lady, is a, a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, a, a device that can be uh, applied in varying degrees of protocols um, several times a day uh, for treatment of headaches and has reduced headache days in some, uh, small studies. Uh, this uh, is called the cephaly device that's uh, being worn here and is an external trigeminal nerve stimulator, um, with also with a couple um, very small uh, promising uh, data sets. I think these will be um, emerging as potential options in those who have not done well on those other types of treatments. And insurances are um, 
slowly catching on to, to help us offer these to our patients. So they're uh, good to know about that they're out there. But things that are not always commonly included in, in the average headache treatment um, are um, physical and uh, behavioral elements of headache. And these are particularly important to post-traumatic headache because of the, the um, injury itself often having residual um, non-headache related symptoms. Um, but they're important to the, the symptom burden that continue to impair the individual. So one uh, element of this is physical therapy. Um, this can be targeted, for example, if an individual has whiplash towards neck, shoulder uh, pain, uh, for example, muscle tension, but also importantly at uh, allowing the individual to get into an exercise routine um, that is sustainable for conditioning, stretching, flexibility, and, and maintaining an active um, physical activity. And sometimes we'll include balance retraining. Um, some of the balance difficulties following a concussion can be persistent into um, months and require training of our balance centers, what are called our vestibular center. And vestibular training can play a role here as well. Those with chronic dizziness and headache can be very difficult um, to, to tease out sometimes because it's hard to tell if the dizziness is related to the headache itself or a separate vis vestibular problem. And that's where this role, the role of the therapist can come in and help tease that out and provide a treatment plan. Uh, again, without medication, a non-invasive approach, um, lifestyle type approach. Um, also behavioral therapy, and this it looks like it's probably a little bit blurry, but trying to give uh, tools to, to one, understanding the connection of the mind and body, and two, trying um, to assist individuals in, in uh, coping and managing uh, the burden that chronic pain is, and finding a way uh, to, to continue to live a full life and manage the negative emotions that surround having um, a chronic uh, painful condition such as this. And I have um, had uh, many success stories uh, move forward only after this element is introduced to their care plan. Really everything else was helping them but not quite enough to get past the hump. In the background, things that we often take for granted are essential in managing um, really any headache disorder, but especially post-traumatic headache. Staying hydrated and having um, a rich electrolyte, um, whether it's in the, um, in the fluids uh, or a dietary intake of electrolytes uh, through a healthy, balanced diet is very important um, to maintaining energy levels and uh, to decrease headache triggers uh, from dehydration or low blood sugars. Uh, sort of hand in hand with the behavioral therapy I introduced on the last slide, relaxation techniques and biofeedback are key for improving sleep that is often disrupted after a concussion. Um, helping uh, minimize depression and anxiety um, through uh, uh, um, behavioral interventions and relaxation techniques and stress reduction which can act as a trigger uh, for, for uh, triggering off and maintaining headaches when they do occur just having a little toolbox to try to help um, wellness. Avoiding headache triggers is very, very similar to the way uh, we approach avoiding migraine triggers. Uh, but there are some additional ones that may be key in this uh, particular type of headache. Excessive alcohol consumption is one of them, can lead to dehydration, leads to changes in blood vessels, um, balance, and can really make that sort of chronic post-concussive syndrome component of the headache uh, profoundly worse and slower to recover. Dehydration I just mentioned. Excessive exertion in heat uh, without um, having a way to cool down can be a trigger or an exacerbator of these types of headaches. And large uh, meals. Additionally, avoiding medication overuse is key. I mentioned that many people are turning to over-the-counter uh, Tylenol or ibuprofen uh, for treating their headaches, and often they're taking this uh, at the same frequency of the headache, which can be every day. And whenever you're taking any of those medicines more than two to three times a week, uh, this can lead to something called medication overuse headache or rebound headache that is in fact making the daily headaches worse or more difficult to treat by other measures. 
Um, so I mentioned that post-traumatic headache is sort of uniquely uh, one of the headache types that we can prevent, uh, in a sense. And um, one of the uh, reasons that is, is that we can uh, learn to identify a concussion and we can initiate or uh, promote the appropriate treatment um, that is needed for concussion. And specifically, that's rest. It's abstaining from the usual activities that challenge you physically mentally and emotionally. Uh, for the athlete, that's simple. That's their, their sport. Um, but for an individual who had a car accident or a fall down the stairs uh, um, that was due to uh, one of those silly stories, you have, you have to rest yourself from the overstimulating environments that are our regular days. But not, we know now, full rest, not going into a dark, quiet room for weeks on end. Um, but uh, uh, minimizing that exertion, minimizing um, some of the stressful tasks at work for a period of time until recovery of the initial concussion symptoms, and then gradually returning to it. Um, so there's sort of a middle ground in this. And really, again, identifying the concussion and talking with a health care provider is how to, to customize that middle ground for an individual. Avoiding repeat injuries. We heard in that, then that vignette of that young lady who had had um, a repeat uh, concussion. We definitely know that if you return to activity um, after a concussion and then get a second concussion on top of that, that the likelihood of having persistent post-traumatic headache um, increases greatly and um, can really uh, lead to increased disability um, in the long run. And I've had, I've seen now many athletes have to retire from their sport due to not knowing this. So they didn't admit their first and second concussions. Their third one took them out of the game because they couldn't play anymore because they couldn't stand up straight. Um, those are really tragic stories. And it's knowing what the first one can do that can help prevent um, that type of situation. And then helmets. Helmets aren't the all, end all be all to protection, um, but having good helmets um, is going to, to be one of those ways to protect our future generations um, who want to continue to engage in, in concussion risk um, activities. Preventing through awareness and reshaping the concussion culture. So not just sports where uh, athlete toughs it out, but in the average everyday thing, you have, um, I, my, my mom came home um, a few months ago and said, oh, I fell down the stairs and I, I bonked my head. I tripped over the dog and man, I have a headache. And I was thinking, well, thanks for talking to me about that. Have you gotten to your doctor yet? Oh, no, no, I've just been going to work and I've been think, feeling like I needed to nap in the middle of the day and I feel like the naps just help. Oh, okay, go to the doctor. Um, she was gonna tough this out. She was gonna continue with her 50 hour a week job and she was going to um, continue um, to press through those symptoms and do her brain harm in, in, in what, we now understand uh, the brain, these brain injuries to be. Uh, thankfully, she recovered and, and does not have uh, chronic consequences of that concussion. I like to think it's because she mentioned it to me and she <laughs> took some days off of work. Um, and also prevention about research, uh, through research. Research will help us understand what post-traumatic headache is and how it differs, differs from migraine um, because I believe that it does. It's not just another migraine-like headache that should be treated like migraine. I think there's different stuff going on and different treatment opportunities. So let me just briefly take you back to this gentleman. Sorry, the, I had these all set up in links, but the, they're of course not working for this purpose. Usually symptoms are short-lived, um, a few days to a week or two, but sometimes they can have long-lasting impact on how a person functions. It may result in other symptoms such as a headache and blurred vision and dizziness and balance disturbance and concentration problems. And then there are symptoms that can be delayed, like difficulty sleeping, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise. I would give 
hit really hard and have one of those moments where you actually forget you got hit and you get up and you just kind of keep playing. And then later on in the day, I realized I kept, I kept forgetting people's names and I kept calling people the wrong names and I kept like ended up in the wrong place and I couldn't put two and two together. I knew something was wrong because I got hit and I just, I was dazed, but you know, I, I just thought it was, it'll, it'll come back. But then my teammates started looking at me and tell, telling me something was wrong with me. I thought I was fine, but then a couple of days later, I started getting headaches and stuff like that. So that's when I really started realizing how bad it was. And, I can't tell you the number of times I've evaluated an athlete and they appear to be okay. You go through your, you know, your series of questions and evaluations and checking the balance and going through, you know, kind of a mini cognitive evaluation, and they appear to be fine. Uh, only later to then develop signs and symptoms, you know, 15, 20 minutes later. Parents best know what's normal for their kid. Are headaches a normal part of their lives? Moodiness, sleep patterns. I mean, parents can monitor all these things. If they're aware of the signs and symptoms of concussion, um, they can be the best ones to tell what's normal for their kid. You need to instill in your athlete or in your son or daughter that they must know the signs and symptoms of concussion. Looks like this is frozen. There we are. <laughs> my computer was showing an entirely different thing. My apologies. Um, all right, so uh, we've gone through these now. You, you know these now by heart. These are symptoms of a concussion, but these are symptoms of post traumatic headache. Um, these uh, knowing about brain injury, knowing about concussion is, is helping promote awareness about post-traumatic headache and the experience of those who have it long term um, and their daily experience now, not just in the context of an injury. I'm going to skip this one because <laughs> of the finicky computer. Um, so I've, I've hit on this a little bit. Our, uh, my goal is about talking of this is a little bit to try to reshape the culture around concussion, not just in sports, but in um, our, our, our communities. Um, some of the ways that this has been promoted for athletes is um, to try to improve uh, positive messages and, and praise for reporting uh, concussion symptoms. Again, as that young lady said, uh, this is a brain injury and, and, and you know, this isn't just my finger or my wrist. We have to not tough this out. Um, helping educate parents and coaches. Um, I'm, working, I'm working with a rugby team or rugby um, league and it's amazing that how um, basic the knowledge is of the trainers and the coaches about how to, to diagnose concussion at the field side. And so really expanding uh, this awareness uh, in programs in our communities. Feeling, uh, uh, helping children uh, and players to be comfortable reporting symptoms um, and supporting teammates who come off due to concussion and then seeing a, a medical professional. So let me talk just a few uh, last minutes about research, uh, research that's happening here at the university. Um, so first I'll touch very briefly on uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Casey Brennan, who I mentioned spoke a couple of weeks ago about the science of, of migraine. His uh, headache physiology lab uh, has focused uh, for years uh, primarily on a unique feature of migraine headache um, called, uh, called a cortical spreading depression. It's thought to be the biologic um, uh, underpinning of migraine aura. Uh, but importantly, uh, these cortical spreading depressions also occur in brain injury. And so their lab, um, which works with mouse models um, and uh, cellular techniques, is uh, also studying an extension from migraine, uh, specifically cortical spreading depression, and uh, changes in sensory and autonomic control, as I mentioned those characteristics of migraine in the first slide, um, in uh, mouse models of migraine. So they have uh, these very neat uh, models where they're able to study through a microscope a, a live wake, a wake mouse um, doing activities, walking around, being stimulated by sensory stimuli, bright lights, sensations. Um, sounds, 
um, and they're able to image its blood vessels and its brain and uh, even its specific neurons um, while it's, it's doing these activities. And uh, it's through these that they're able to understand the changes in electrical activity that occur during um, this cortical spreading depression phenomenon that's thought to be the migraine aura and in uh, models of, of head trauma also able to understand the same electrical blood flow and cellular changes that occur in head trauma and compare it uh, to migraine models. Um, so that lab is working hard on that and we're, we've worked together um, to connect the things that we're studying in, in the mouse models to humans. And so that brings us to my laboratory, um, and I uh, study primarily autonomic function. And so I introduce that as blood flow of uh, blood pressure, heart rate, gut, um, how our pupils respond to light, how our bodies uh, respond to heat, uh, is autonomic physiology. And I study that in headache disorders, um, including migraine and post-traumatic headache. Um, we first started studying um, these autonomic measures in uh, migraine disorders. And so this is EM is episodic migraine, CM is chronic migraine, and P PTH is persistent post-traumatic headache. And as we were setting out to study the migraine, we had a number of people who came in saying, I have chronic migraine. And we characterized their headaches and found out, no, you actually have persistent post-traumatic headache. And we saw that those individuals had dramatically differing um, responses. And so this is a measure of uh, pupillary responses to light. And this is the time it takes them to respond to light. And you see a, a, a dramatic delay in, in these responses in post-traumatic headache individuals, suggesting that there is this physiologic difference between post-traumatic headache um, compared to chronic migraine. We wanted to ask, well, if, if in persistent post-traumatic headache, pupillary um, function is different, what about really early, just after a concussion? So we studied, um, this is a set um, of 10 individuals with, uh, con who received a concussion during the course of a sports um, uh, season. We had tested these individuals at baseline before their sports season started. And immediately after their concussion, again, the, this is a different measure of pupillary function. Their pupillary uh, responses were delayed acutely after concussion. And in these individuals, they recovered from their concussion and over a series of weeks. And by one month, their pupillary responses and their symptoms were back to their preseason baseline. So this is what it looks like to recover. The pupillary responses seem to, be, um, to follow those symptoms in these individuals. So it's not just pupils that are altered in this acute concussion phase. And so we're, we wanted to follow this out a little bit further in um, blood pressure and heart rate. So this is a, a, an example of what we call a tilt table test. This green line is, um, is the, a heart rate response. This red line is a blood pressure response. The shaded box is where they, the individual is gone from lying position in the white to tilted up into a standing position supported by the table in the gray. And in a normal individual, you have just a tiny bump up of blood pressure while, when you stand up to maintain your physiology, your blood flow to your head, for example, um, and to be able to walk around and um, remain uh, asymptomatic. But in somebody who's had a concussion, during the same type of uh, tilt table challenge, they have a brief dip in their blood pressure and then un instability of blood pressure throughout the tilt up and then an increase in their heart rate in response to this unstable blood pressure. What happens if they do not recover from their concussion? Well, that uh, pattern remains. And this is an individual three months out. Uh, she continues to have persistent dizziness, exercise intolerant, and headache or post-traumatic headache. Um, where she is having marked increase in her heart rate and an instability of her blood pressure while upright on this tilt table. And this is mimicking what's happening in her everyday life. She can't return to exercise partially due to instability of her blood pressure and her heart rate responses to what exercise does to her physiology. This is not her normal baseline. And this is part of her symptom burden. And this is part of what I think is happening in people who have chronic post-traumatic headache that we're not always identifying, which is why I included hydration, exercise, um, and electrolytes in the treatment plan for post-traumatic headache. 
So the next steps from here, our study is currently um, looking to put these pieces together to, to follow this physiology, these two measures, the pupils and the blood pressure changes that we see um, from acute concussion through to post-traumatic headache within a set of individuals. And so this takes, given the estimates ranging from 30% to 90%, we don't know how many concussions we'll need to follow a meaningful number out into post-traumatic headache. So we have to follow large numbers of people through um, to see who, re re who recover and who don't, and if these measures correlate with their recovery. And how um, this will affect our treatment approaches, whether there are interventions that can be taken early on when these are ident physiologic changes are identified, and whether that can affect treatment of the headaches um, early on and prevent long-term. So those are the things that we're working on in the coming um, months and years. Well, right now we're enrolling for uh, this same study that I introduced to you um, early data from. Uh, for this, we need individuals without headaches to compare those with headaches too. Um, so we're always looking uh, for volunteers who, who are um, healthy non-headache um, uh, supporters of research as well as those who ex have suffered from post-traumatic headaches and migraines. And so with that, I'd like to take any questions. Yeah. I have a question about uh, recent literature on headaches, although I think they were directing more at migraine than this, mm -hmm. is low dose Narcan. Mm -hmm. And I was, would you comment on that? Is anyone going to potentially look at low dose Narcan in this indication? Because looking at the, the effect of the triptans, you'd think, well, the triptans yeah. are helping, perhaps other things that help migraine would help. Anything you know, on? I have not seen a systematic study looking at uh, low dose uh, naltrexone um, is another thing, low dose Narcan. Um, these agents make sense that they should work um, for this as a chronic pain syndrome. Um, there are other chronic pain forms, non-headache chronic pain forms that these have been used in effectively, um, and headache being one of them. Uh, but given the paucity of post-traumatic headache studies for treatment methods at all, um, I, I, I ca cannot say that I've seen anybody interested in that, though it, it seems like a reasonable, and I can say anecdotally, I've seen individuals respond to therapies like that. What specifically were you looking at in the, the neurogenic inflammation? I mean, were, you, were you looking at you know, T-bars? Were you looking you know, the, the so, peroxide? So cytokines and other inflammatory mediators like cytokines, um, there are a number of, um, it, for example, if you tore a muscle uh, that would be um, released uh, in the inflammatory cascade, they're very, it's a very similar cascade, um, it, but it's occurring in the brain and around the blood vessels of the brain. I guess my question is, is that there are a number of other, let's say you had an IgG4 reaction in the gut, mm -hmm. so you're going to have chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm wondering if chronic inflammation in other areas would in fact feed into the fact and, and continue the inflammation in the brain. So chronic inflammation in headache is very controversial. Um, Generally speaking, in post-traumatic headache specifically, we think that that is only a phenomenon of acute trauma, meaning during that first week in the acute phase that that's a part of the mechanism of the pain, and that beyond that, that inflammation is not maintaining the pain, that there are other things maintaining the pain beyond that. There are, in the in, in migraine research world, um, still people who are really um, persistent in their search for a connection to chronic inflammation as a source for migraine, um, though there are many skeptics of that um, type of mechanism as well. And I think the same is true for post-traumatic as it is for migraine in that category. Are you doing anything else specifically for the looking at the autonomic balance? Mm -hmm. Specifically, I didn't notice 24-hour uh, heart rate Variability, HRV. We're looking yeah. at HRV, not 24 hour. Um, I, I skimmed over it, but we have here, these measures right here are actually measures of heart rate variability. 
um, that are altered, um, this, it decreases significantly. When heart rate variability decreases, it's a sign of increase in sympathetic, uh, or the adrenaline side of the autonomic nervous system, and that's the autonomic balance you're referring to. Um, we do think that there's a shift in the autonomic balance towards a hypersympathetic state um, that could be contributing, um, and that's part of the hypothesis that we're um, leading with. On your blood pressure monitoring, was, was it, how invasive was it? What were you using? Was it Good just question. standard cuff yeah. at every five minutes? We, we use a non-invasive monitor that does beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure. So it, it truly takes each beat of the, of the heart rate and measures blood pressure in a non-invasive format. So each of these is, is a true um, manifestation of the heart rate on a continuous basis. Or sorry, blood pressure on a continuous okay. basis. Um, several companies now. There, it, there's the. Um, What's it officially called then? Finipress was the original. Uh, Finipress was the first um, uh, in the field that really opened up the ability to monitor blood pressure non-invasively. They used to have to put a pressure gauge into the artery directly, and it was what he's referring to. Um, this is now, we have a Nextfin and a CNAP. Those are newer versions of the same technology. Um, how many, so I know you guys are still doing the research right now. Do you know, or do you have a timeline on when you think you will publish? Um, we're hoping to be able to publish our first set, this, this early observation. This is um, I've participated in this, and this is really interesting. Yeah. yeah, this first set of data um, we're hoping to be able to publish in the next six months. Um, with this uh, part where we're following through the individuals who receive the concussion long term is going to take years um, to collect the data. Um, so that'll be a little bit slower. Now, thank you for participating. Yeah. Well, I did follow up. Sorry, I, just, That's I okay. did it, but I didn't have mine in a year out. Yeah. So, so you, yeah, you, you may be somewhere in, in here. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So, as a participant, do you give feedback as to what country? Yeah. Receive? No, we do not. Um, specifically, the university ethics um, board asks us not to provide. Um, medical information back to research participants without um, the direct relationship of a physician provider. Um, and our research program w w isn't set up to be able to provide that in concert. Um, so it does have that limitation. You wouldn't necessarily know how you were categorized within the study or the outcome of, of your results um, unless you had a, a physician um, who could access this information and give it to you in a sort of in unrelated way to the research itself. And that's an ethical requirement by the research boards. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your kind patience and I apologize for the, the um, technological glitches this evening.